Welcome everyone to the Global Power BI community. My name is Sarah Shea Jesus, and today we're gonna have presenting for us Devin Knight from Fanatic Parks. We're gonna give some highlights about our, our Global Power BI community. Uh, our Global Power BI community always have a session from an expert from the industry. We have presence, uh, leader participation worldwide. Also, we have worldwide presence in different countries. Uh, our Facebook uh, um, group has like 2.9K members and we have like 1,000 plus, plus LinkedIn members in our group. Also, like we have 600 plus registered members in our community page. I want to mention like some upcoming sessions, so you guys need to start registering for this upcoming session. Our next session is going to be Power BI Sharing uh, and Security on Lex. Uh, with uh, Raza Reed. Um, next session is going to be endless possibilities in Power BI with Leila. Uh, these sessions are going to happen uh, October 31st and November the 9th. Today, we're going to we're going to be talking about simplifying predictive analytics with Power BI with Devin Knight. And Devin is a Microsoft MVP and training director of Promotic Works Consulting. Uh, he's an author of six SQL Server books and a speaker of conference like Past Summit, Past Business Analytics Conference, SQL Service, and CONCAT. Uh, he's also contributing a uh, member for the Past Business Intelligence virtual chapter, and Devin is president of the local user groups in Jacksonville. How you guys can connect with us? You guys can connect in Twitter at Global uh, PUG. Uh, also Facebook, LinkedIn, and Power Community site. Uh, if you guys want to get all the updates from our community, well, we encourage you guys to go and register to our community. Um, HTTP the big guy do uh, Power BI R E G. And if you guys want to present for our community, you can you guys can reach out uh, B Power and E De Jesus at Aptu dot com. Uh, with this, I hand it over to Devin, and Devin can start with the presentation. Thank you, everyone. Sounds good. Let me share my screen. And let me know when you can see my screen. Hopefully it's showing the right one. It didn't really ask me which one. Perfect. We can see it. Perfect. Can you see my uh, slide deck? Is that right? Yes. Simply okay, perfect. For the analytics. All right. Well, uh, thank you, Eric, for having me and, and, and for everyone for, for joining. Looks like we've got a few people still coming in. Um, in today's session, we're going to be focusing in, again, all around predictive analytics. And uh, even a lot, of, a lot of our session is actually going to be just showing a lot of what you can do with the R language and Power BI. And uh, some of that isn't necessarily even predictive analytics capabilities, but some of the things that you can do uh, that you can use to extend what Power BI has available to it using the, the R language. So we're going to see uh, a little bit of both, some, some just from a usability perspective, how Power BI and R work together. And then also we're going to look at uh, really how R can be used to enhance and go beyond what's, what's typical in Power BI. Uh, so if you're not familiar, Eric, thank you for giving me a great introduction, but if you're not familiar with who I am, uh, like Eric said, I am the training director here at Pridematic Works. Uh, so that means I work uh, with a lot of instructors. Actually, we got uh, at least one of them on the call here today. Thomas is one of our instructors. Uh, and I work with a lot of our instructors and some of our internal folks and external folks. So if you're ever interested in actually developing courses for us yourself, let me know. And that's something we're interested in working with you on. Uh, but we do uh, things like free training webinars like this every Tuesday. We also do uh, paid training as well. We have uh, up, we're actually up to eight Power BI courses. We're hoping by the end of the year we'll have 10 different Power BI courses. Um, those varies from kind of the basics of using Power BI desktop. Uh, we're working on an advanced Power BI course right now. Uh, we have a Power BI administration course, one for the data consumer, so one that, not necessarily for those that do development, but more for those end users that need to be able to interact with Power BI and understand how it works. Uh, so we have a lot of, we have, and also all the kind of Excel variations of Power BI as well, so things like Power Pivot, Power Query, those sort of things we have courses on as well. So we do a lot around training, a lot around data training, not just Power BI. We actually have 30 plus courses in total. Uh, I'm also a Microsoft Data Platform MVP, which means something, I guess. <laughs> and I've also authored several books. Uh, all of them do have to do with SQL Server, none, none on donkeys. Uh, I also run a local, local user group in Jacksonville, Florida. It's called the Jacksonville SQL Server User Group. 
and I've been running that for uh, about five or six years now. And uh, we just had our big event a few moments, a few months ago, actually in August, a SQL Saturday event where we had about uh, 500 folks come out and learn all about how to work with data with Microsoft technologies. Uh, we also, I, I also blog at a website called DevonNightSQL.com. I do quite a bit of blogging there. If you follow any the activity on the Facebook group, I usually post at least one thing in the Facebook group once a week. Uh, because I blog uh, at minimum once a week about Power BI, and I I'll oftentimes post that in the Facebook group, uh, typically around the Power BI custom visuals and what kind of things you can do with those visuals. Uh, because there's really no instructions on how to use them, I kind of took it upon myself to, to do a blog series on all the custom visuals that are available. All right, so our plan for today, so this time that we have together, it may be, you know, we got about 50 minutes here together. Uh, I have several demos. It's gonna be a really heavy demo intensive session. I have one slide after this one, uh, and uh, past that slide, we're gonna spend a lot of time showing you what's possible with R, what's possible with, uh, what, what, what makes R so special and how you can enhance what you can do with Power BI. So I got one more slide after this, but then we'll, we'll be all demos. Uh, so we're going to focus on how we can do that. Then we'll actually, like I said, show you a lot of what it can do uh, inside of the Power BI desktop. So uh, for those of you that aren't really familiar with R and are just kind of learning a little bit about it, uh, R is actually a free open source language. It's used for doing statistical analysis and doing uh, visualizing graphics and things like that. But it's, it's oftentimes thought of as a language that can be used for doing predictive analytics. Uh, you'll see a lot of people use that, whether you're using things like uh, Azure Machine Learning, you can plug in R scripts there, whether you're using Power BI or other tools and other technologies, it has the ability to, um, and with a very large library of scripts that you can import, be able to extend and what's possible. So the R language is, is again, it's a tool set of a bunch of libraries. It's a bunch of libraries. You can almost think of it like PowerShell. If you've worked with PowerShell from, from this perspective, it's a coding language that you can import different libraries in and then have the ability to do extra data cleansing or extra data predictive analytics. Uh, it has a lot built in that you can bring in. So what do you need to do it? If you want to actually work with R, if you want to follow some of the samples I want to show you today, uh, you'll need to uh, at least install R for Windows. Uh, and you can find R for Windows, uh, assuming you're running a Windows machine, uh, by going to cran.rproject.org. And uh, from there, you'll actually see where you can download the, the R client, the R uh, installation for Windows. And then once you do that, you'll also want to make sure you also have a, a client that you can open up and run code against. And that can be what it could be one of two things. Really, there's a lot of different interfaces for writing R scripts. You can even do it in Visual Studio if you wanted to. But you'll want to probably install either the Microsoft R client, which is okay. It's it's nice. It lets you run some scripts, but it's not as uh, thorough as you might like as a IDE for for running R. Uh, really, the R Studio is is a great tool for working with R. And you might see me open that a couple times. I might actually show you a little bit of both the R Microsoft R client, maybe some R Studio, just to show you the differences between them. Uh, but you'll you'll want to be able to run R scripts in one of those two client tools. Uh, kind of think of this as if you come from a SQL background, think of this like Management Studio, where you would open Management Studio to run queries. That's kind of the same thing with R Studio or or the R client by Microsoft. You'll also likely want to get started by looking at some of the samples that are available to you. So if you're really not an R guy or girl, you, 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 don't, you don't work a lot with R and you want to be able to learn how to get started with it and maybe how it can integrate well with Power BI, there are a lot of examples out there. There's people that have been developing R for all, in R with for all different platforms for quite a while now. And so you can actually go find some, uh, some samples if you go to on the Microsoft uh, community site, so the community.powerbi.com, you'll find there's a, a showcase, an R script showcase that if I launch this here and I can show you what it looks like. Oh, I already had it open, let me bring that over. This actually has a, a library or showcase, they call it, of several different kinds of R scripts that you can take a look at. Most of them having to do with data visualizations. So you can see you can actually create data visualizations that don't even exist. So uh, an example of one of our customers that really uh, is interested in this is they're looking at something like the schedule view. And they want to be able to actually plot out, um, it's a hospital, and they want to be able to plot out operating um, operating room utilization. So they want to know, they think right now that their operating rooms are getting underutilized because they're not really tracking the, the, the time that they're being used very well. And so they think that they could actually do a better job scheduling and they want to be able to build out some reports, uh, typically uh, with, with an R script that they can use something like this as an example. 
they're actually building their own version of it. But that would allow them to actually be able to plot out that information. And it doesn't necessarily have anything predictive in nature, but it does use R to be able to extend what Power BI has available. I'm going to show you, for example, one later where we're going to show you the, the map with connecting lines. And I'll show you how you can actually create this nice little map visual here um, using an R script. Now, I don't plan on going super deep and teaching you the, really even the basics of R. I really just want you to get an idea of what's possible so that way, hopefully, it'll spur some ideas in yourself. And when you go back to, to your office, whether you're there now or whether you're going to be there tomorrow, you'll be able to come up with some ideas of hopefully how you can use it in scenarios for yourself. So again, there's a lot of examples out here. You can search for the R script showcase, and you should be able to find uh, all the samples that are already out here, or you can submit your own. So you can spend some time learning it and submit your own. Uh, by the way, I, I, you know, I don't want to heavily plug my, 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 my own content too much, but um, we actually have at Pragmatic Works, we have a uh, introduction to our course that's coming out as well. Uh, it's not so much integrated with Power BI, although we have a course for that coming as well, but it's more focused on just learning R in general from, from the basics. So if you're interested in that, let me know. That should actually be out next month. All right. So we've talked a bit about what it can do it's going to help us extend what we can do in power bi there is a predictive analytics nature to it there's some statistical computing that's involved with it or there can be at least let's actually walk you through several samples of what it can do and there's really three different areas with inside of power bi itself that you can use our scripts so you're 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 able to easily take what you've already developed and enhance what you can do in a multitude of ways, okay? So the first thing I wanna do is I'm gonna go launch open the Power BI desktop. I'm not gonna spend too much time spending, uh, giving you a basics of Power, Power BI. I assume many of you are fairly familiar with Power BI already, so I don't wanna waste too much of your time with that. And uh, what we're gonna do in Power BI is we're going to start by connecting to a data source. Of course, anytime we want to do something in Power BI, we gotta start by connecting to our data source. And in this case, I'm gonna go connect to a basic little CSV file here. So I'm gonna to connect to a text file. And for this example, we're gonna be connecting to a file called European Stock Market. And this is actually a sample that Microsoft put out, so you can actually go find it yourself. I'll be happy to send it to you if you're interested in seeing it as well. Now the problem with this data set, and the, the, so the problem that we're trying to solve with this data set is if I make this a little larger, you'll see, is we're getting for each day an entry for the stock market index for the European stock market. Okay, so we can see values coming back, uh, except for on the 15th day and the 20th day, for some reason those values weren't recorded at, uh, for, for some whatever reason that may be. And so because of that, it's going to skew my reports quite a bit. And I can try and build some reports off this, but it's certainly going to skew them some. So what I'd like to do is I want to be able to use the R scripting language to actually predict what those values should have been. Okay, I don't, I obviously I don't have what they are here, that it's not in the data, but you can use the R scripting language to actually do a find missing values basically, or replace missing values based on the values that are surrounding it. So it's gonna look at the pattern of the data around it, and based on that pattern or influx or trend in the data around it, it's going to give you a prediction on what those values should have been. All right, so if I wanna do that, this is more of a transform that we're trying to do, because there's really three ways you can use R and Power BI. One, you can use it as a source. So if you go underneath get data and hit more, I'm gonna show you this in a, in a moment you'll find that there is an R script source here. So you can actually plug in an entire R script, which is nice. I'll show you uh, one of the reasons why you might do that here in a few moments. You can also do uh, R as a visual. So you'll notice over here, right here, hopefully that zoom shows up for you guys, where you can actually make the uh, an, a, a visual out of R as well. So you have a, a couple different places you can use R. One as a source, one as a visual. And then the third place, I mentioned there's three. The third place is as a transform. So you'll actually find that inside the query editor. If I, I were to go back over to my source one more time, and to make it to make R as a transform, we're going to have to go into the query editor, which once this launches here for me, there it is. I would click edit to take that take myself over to the query editor. Again, the problem we're trying to solve is replacing these missing values here. All right, so I'll hit edit. And once I hit edit, it's gonna launch open the query editor for me, okay? And of course you have all the typical data transforms available to you from Power BI here. But what we wanna do again is to replace these values. Now the, the script that we're gonna use for this is actually fairly simple. And I'm gonna go ahead and show it to you on the screen and then I'm gonna talk you through how you would use it, okay? 
So I have a script here called find missing values. And it's just a tiny little script. The part that we actually care about is the part down here. But if we want to use this script inside of Power BI, there's a few things that we need to tell Power BI before we can use it. One, we have to tell Power BI where our R script library is. Where, where are we storing all of our R script libraries? So that's the first thing we have to do. The second thing that we need to do is this top part where it says install.packages mice. Mice is the little library that we want to install in here, the package that's going to have all of the necessary code or script, script for us. Uh, I need to actually install that. And you don't necessarily install this in Power BI. You actually need to go open up something like RStudio or that Microsoft client that I mentioned earlier to install the package. Okay, so I'm going to walk you through both those things. The two things I mentioned, one is we need to connect Power BI and tell it where our R script sources are, our, our R script libraries are. It's a lot of R's there. Uh, and then second, we need to actually tell it that we want to install this package so that we can run the code below. Now, the code below is not too complicated. Just to highlight this briefly, um, basically, we're passing in the data set that we have into a, a little temporary uh, set, kind of in memory. And then we're going to use that to be able to use this mice library to find missing values. And it's actually going to do two different outputs for us. One is going to have the outputs where it's just simply replace the values. And then two, we'll have a second output that's going to have the values as they, they existed previously and then a new column next to it with the missing, with the replaced values. So we're going to see what this can do for us here. But we, again, first of things first, we have to do two steps. One, install this library and then two, connect Power BI to that library. All right, so I'm going to go ahead and copy out this installation. And I'm going to launch our studio. That's going to be the first thing we're going to do. And it'll take just a moment and it'll, it'll launch here for us. All right, and you can see I have quite a few things uh, going on here. I'm going to go ahead and close that out and start with a new script here. And it's pretty simple. I already copied it. So all I have to really do is paste this in here. Let me control V that. And it's going to install this package. And that's going to have everything that's necessary to be able to run the rest of the script that we have. So I'm going to go ahead and hit enter. And it really does all the work for me. It's going to go download and install the script for me. You can see it's plugging it into a certain library here. And I've actually already installed it, so there's no really need to do anything special here because we've already had it installed. Now, the other component of this, like I mentioned, is having this connected to Power BI. Now, to have it connect to Power BI, we'll need to go to our File and Options menu. So I'll go up to File and Options. And you'll find the R scripting section here is what you need to configure. So this section right here where it says detected R home directory, that's where you need to make sure that you have R and Power BI connected to each other. So it's looking for that library that we just installed a moment ago, that package that we just installed a moment ago. It's looking for the location of that, and we have stored ours in this particular location here. So if you didn't have that selected, you would come in and you could actually select other, and you can find the location where yours is stored. Now, I've installed R several times here, so it has a bunch of different locations for me but we're going to be using the one here that's R-3.4.1. You can also see if you haven't already installed R, you can do that from here. So if you haven't already downloaded the client tool or if you haven't downloaded the actual uh, engine for R, you can download and install that here. That's easily available for you. All right, so in my case, everything's already connected up, and I'm good to go. So I'll go ahead and hit cancel here. And then for the, the transform that we want to apply, we're going to go to the transform tab up top. So you should be able to see the transform tab up in the very top left. And then on the far right under the transform tab, you'll find there's this option here called run our script. Okay, so it's on the far right of my screen right now. I'll go ahead and select that. And it's basically going to open up a nice little uh, I shouldn't say nice. It's pretty. It's a pretty terrible editor. There's really nothing that you can do here. You can't test your code. It's basically an empty, uh, an empty text box where you can drop your code in. And so what we're going to do is we're going to drop our code in here. Yes, but um, I want to make it so that let me pull it aside here for a moment. I want to make it so that uh, you guys can kind of understand what's going on. Basically, this this editor is it's a it's an empty box. And so all I have to really do is take the code that I had in my nice little text file, paste that in. And it's going to do most of the magic here for me. It's doing some sampling to be able to see where the data should be. And then based on that sampling, it's going to output the results of what I should have in those missing values. All right, so if I hit OK on this, again, I, I, like I said in the early on, not, the purpose of the session isn't necessarily to teach you the details of how you can use R. It's more about to, to show you what's possible 
uh, with Power BI and R. All right, so we have a uh, two data sets that have really outputted from this, or two tables that have been outputted from this. You have one called completed data, and you can select the table option right here, the cell where it says table in it, and it'll show you what the values look like below. And if you remember, we were missing values in row 15, so you can see there's a value in row 15, and I think the other one was 20 or something like that. You can scroll down, and you can see where those missing values um, are now replaced. The other option here called output, this actually shows you, if you select that one, this is going to show you what the value was and what it got replaced to. So it was uh, set to null, and that null value got replaced with 1723.8. And then on day 20, it was null, and we replaced it with 1723.1. So we can kind of see where we were and where, we, where we've now replaced our values to with these two different outputs that it's provided to us. Now, I don't necessarily care about the, the original data set here in this case. I just want to see what the completed values have now been once they've been replaced. So I can select the table link, and it will bring across the completed data set that does not really show me where the missing values are if I don't really care about them. And I can go ahead and hit close and apply and build a nice little visual out of this, maybe a, a simple line chart to be able to show me where all those values have been over, over time. So it makes for a simple little way. Let's just go ahead and complete this example. We'll make a line chart here so that we can actually see how those values would show. Now, had I brought in the other data set that was missing values, we'd see some pretty sharp declines in here uh, where those values had not been fixed or had not been replaced. So this is a small example. Again, a small amount of uh, code really here, only four or five, five lines of code to be able to find values, look at surrounding values and replace them where, where necessary. All right, cool, so that's our first example. The second example I wanna show you guys is um, I'm gonna start off with a partially built out example. And so what I'm gonna do in this one is I'm gonna open up a partially completed version here. Let me bring this open for you guys. And what I want to show you in this one is some of the built-in capabilities for uh, predictive analytics. So this one isn't necessarily an R example, although some of that may be happening behind the scenes. What I really want to show you in this example is how you can use the built-in predictive, predictive analytics capabilities of Power BI. You don't have to know any kind of scripting for this. You don't have to know any kind of code. It's all kind of right clicks to be able to create and do some predictive analytics. So the two things we're going to show. One is forecasting. So you, many of you may already be aware that you can do forecast lines inside Power BI. And then the other thing that I want to show also is going to be clustering and how you can actually run a clustering algorithm behind the, sun, behind the scenes to group your values or group certain values into different clusters. Okay. All right. So first thing that we're going to do is we're going to go up to the line chart that we have here. Okay. And the data that we're looking at here, by the way, is baseball data. I'm not sure how many of you guys are baseball fans, but you can see these are different baseball teams, different cities of baseball teams, franchises, I should say. And then on the top here, this line chart that we're looking at, let me make this a little larger. The line chart that we're looking at is by year, the number of home runs that each, uh, the total league has had. So we can see there's some big fluctuations um, in the number of home runs. One of the big years for home runs was kind of the late 90s, 2000s here. And then 2016 was also a pretty big year for home runs. But what I'd like to do is I want to be able to try and do some predictions on what the home runs might look like in the future, okay? So I want to know what's going to happen in the future. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to have this line chart selected. I'll go over to the analytics pane. I'm not sure how many of you guys have played around with the analytics side of some of the visuals that are available to you. But if you select the analytics side here, you'll see there's a bunch of different kind of uh, statistical lines that you can add, things like the max, the min, the trend line, uh, median, percentile line, forecasting. There's all kinds of things that you can add into the report itself or into the chart itself. And in this example, what we're going to do is add in a forecasting line. Now, one thing I want to make sure I highlight as you're, you're looking at this is there are some things that you can do to actually make this forecasting option not appear. Uh, one of those has to do with the granularity of the, the data itself. So I believe it is under, let's see, is it, here it is. Under the x-axis, you must have a continuous value. So you'll see right here underneath the x-axis, the type, you'll see that it's set to a continuous value. It does have to be a continuous value if you want to use the forecasting option that we're looking at. Uh, if it's set to a categorical option, 
like this. So you can see it actually returns back every single value. As soon as you change it to categorical, you'll notice that the forecasting line option is no longer there. So just something to be aware of. I'm going to undo that and send it back to how it was. But just be aware that if you have more of a categorical value, it won't work. Now, some of you might be asking, what is categorical versus continuous? What's the difference between those two? Well, the difference between probably the easiest way to explain this is you can think of categorical. OK, here's our options. You can think of categorical uh, as um, dis uh, discrete. It's another word for discrete. I'm not sure how many of you guys have actually done things like data mining, SQL Server data mining in the past. Discrete values are ones that typically have a low number of distinct values. So think of things like a product category. There's only so many product categories you can have, and that's more of a discrete value or a categorical value that you have. A continuous value is you have so many distinct possibilities of what the, the value might be that comes up that it's, uh, for example, it's not something you would ever put in a drop-down filter. Okay, so what I mean by that is if you were going to allow your users to actually uh, filter your reports, maybe with a slicer, you would never make it a drop down slicer because there'd be so many distinct values that they would never be able to find the value that they actually need. That means there's so many distinct possible values. And when you choose a continuous data type or data type, that does allow you then to do some more predictive analytics. You have, that's really the, 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 the limit of one of the things that you have to have if you're going to be able to, or if you choose to do forecasting. All right, so enough about that. Let's actually go ahead and implement this. So we'll select forecast and we'll add a forecast line here. Okay, so you can see the forecast already implemented here. And you can see it has kind of this cone. It's been uh, hurricane season for a lot of people. I'm in Florida, so that we've had a lot of this kind of look to us. But kind of this cone of uncertainty here where the values that it's predicting are going to fall somewhere in between this cone. So you can actually see it's predicting out 10 years into the future. How do I know 10 years in the future? Well, one, you can look at it on the chart, and you can see it started in 2016, my data set did. And it's predicting all the way out to 2026. You can also see that, uh, the number of units that it's predicting into the future. If you look into the, the analytics pane right here, you can see that it's predicting in 10 units or 10 points into the future. So you can actually control that if you wanted to. You can change it from instead of doing 10 units into the future, maybe make it something like five units into the future. If you make a change to that, though, you need to make sure you hit apply here, and then it'll reapply that, that prediction that you've done. The other thing that you can do as well is if you're, if you're uncertain on whether or not this forecast is accurate, you can actually change and tell that you want to ignore a certain number of years in this case. So if I wanted to ignore, let's say I wanted to ignore the last three years, I can hit apply. And you'll notice what it's done here is it's actually pre pretended like those years didn't even happen. And my forecast line predicted what the values would have been for those years that did happen as well as the two years after that. So it did as best it could. It couldn't have predicted this big, sharp decline and then incline again. But it did have kind of a happy median. You can see that cone actually lies within that range of values that we have. OK, it's kind of interesting. You have that capability built into Power BI. The other type of for, um, predictive analytics that are built into Power BI are around clustering. So we have this um, scatter chart here on the bottom. And the scatter chart on the bottom is showing us, let me go ahead and full screen this for a moment. The scatter chart on the bottom here is showing us each of the different baseball franchises. And we're looking at the uh, year on the play axis. So I can actually play this and see how the, each of the franchises have changed over time and how well they've done. Uh, but I can also see here the number of home runs they've had by team. So uh, my horizontal axis here is based on the number of home runs. My vertical axis is the number of wins. And then the size of the bubble is, let's see, the size of the bubble is represented by the number of runs that each team has scored. Okay, so home runs and runs don't necessarily equate to each other, but I can see the size of the bubble is represented by the number of runs. Now, what I'd like to do is I kind of assume that if you're in the, the top right quadrant, meaning you have a lot of home runs and a lot of wins, you're probably a pretty good team. Frankly, if you have a lot of wins, if you're in the top half of the chart, you should be a pretty good team. So what I'd like to do is I want to do some kind of a clustering in here. And so what I can do is for a moment, I'm going to take out the size. OK, and just look at each of the teams, regardless of the number of runs they've scored. I want to look at home runs and wins here. And I want to try and organize these together in different clusters. And I would say anyone that's you know, above a certain range is a playoff team, likely. Anyone below a certain range is probably not a playoff team. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to go up to the top right uh, corner of this chart where it says more options. 
And let's see what I'm missing here. Oh, you know what? Let me build, rebuild this chart real quickly. I'm going to rebuild it one more time just so we can see it kind of beginning to end. And I'm going to put, um, let's uh, look at this for a particular uh, value here. So I'm going to add in, let's do the home runs again and wins. Let's see, where did home runs go? Sorry, guys. I realized there's one other thing I wanted to make a change to on here. And we're looking at this by franchise. There we go. And by wins. So wins obviously should be further down right here. Okay, there we go. That's a little bit better representation of what I want to see. The other, the previous one, by the way, was filtered to a particular um, range that I didn't want to filter to. But now looking at all the teams across all the ranges here that we have, I can go up to the top right corner where it says more options. There we go. And now you'll see there's this option here called automatically uh, cluster, automatically flying clusters. Another way you can do some predictive analytics built in here where it'll do and run some algorithms behind the scenes, a clustering algorithm to be able to find how each of these values group together best. And so I can find the clusters. And when you tell it that you want to create clusters, it's actually going to create a new field inside of your data model. And I can tell it, what do I want to call this cluster? So it's going to, right now it's going to call it franchise ID clusters, which might be fine if you'd like. Uh, but you can really name it whatever you want. You can also tell it how many clusters you want. So the number of clusters right now is set to automatic. But maybe I want to make there be three clusters. And so I can type in the number three. And when I hit OK, it's going to actually automatically cluster each of these into three separate groups. So I'll probably have, I would imagine the top right corner will be run one group. The kind of middle section here is another group. And then the bottom left is my, my bottom dwellers here. These are the ones that uh, just are never, probably not gonna be in the playoffs for a long time. So uh, this is pretty interesting. Now what I can do is I can also, uh, let's do this. Let me filter it to one particular year, just so it's a little easier to see. And so we're not looking at it across too big of a range here. I'm going to add in a quick filter. Let me go down to the filter section here. Okay. And we'll make this a basic filter. Let's, ba let's filter it to last year. Okay. Now, one of the problems with what I've done here is I, I've, I've added the, the clustering prior to uh, making that filter. So there is a little bit of uh, kind of inconsistencies that can happen if you do that. So probably what will be best is for me to rerun that cluster one more time. Let me delete it first. Since I added the filter a little bit late, it does tend to mess things up. I've already created the cluster. So let's create the cluster one more time. We'll put it in the three groups again. And then there we get a little bit better breakdown. So I can see cluster one in the top right are likely my playoff teams. I can hover above them and actually see who they were. Cleveland, yeah, they went to the World Series last year. Uh, Chicago, they won the World Series last year. Uh, Washington Nationals, they were, I believe they went to the playoffs. So yeah, I have quite a good little breakdown here. Now you'll notice that the clusters here are called cluster one, cluster two, cluster three. You can, of course, go into the cluster. You can come over to the field list on the, oh, sorry guys. You can come over to the field list on the right-hand side right here. And you can right click and edit one of your clusters. So I can edit the cluster there on the bottom. And you can rename each of these clusters if you wanted to. So I can tell it that I want to rename cluster one. Let's call this uh, playoff teams. And I can rename, let's see where they are. Cluster two is probably uh, bottom dwellers here. Losing teams. And then cluster three is kind of somewhere in between. Well, really, they're lose. They're um, some of them are losing quite a bit as well. So we'll just call it. We'll leave it as that. But the point being, I want to show you. You can change the names of those clusters, and you can see they reappear on the chart here with those new names. Okay. So pretty neat capability built in. You didn't really have to write any code to make that happen, but they easily was able to do that. Now the other thing you can also do with a with a scatter chart, which is what we're looking at here, is you can actually add kind of a nice background to this if you wanted to. So I can do something like this. I can go underneath the format paintbrush area here, go down to the plot area, and tell it that I want to add an image to the background of the chart. So I can do something like this. Go ahead and add an image here. Tell it the location. Here, let me copy and paste my location here. And I can paste in a, chart, uh, a background image, something like this. And then you could actually tell it over here that you want to make it fill or fit the entirety of the, the chart. And you can kind of see how these break down. Really, my, my top half are my better teams. My bottom left are probably some of my worst teams. And then the, 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 
bottom right, there really isn't anybody in there because probably if you're hitting a ton of home runs, you're probably winning more than within you're losing. So interesting way, again, that you can be able to pull together a nice chart like this, use some of the interconnected capabilities of Power BI already without having to write any code. All right, the next thing I wanna show you is something else that you can do with R. So we're gonna take a step back over to what we can do with the, the R query language. And in this example, what we're gonna show is how you can actually, it, it really doesn't have a ton to do with predictive analytics in this example, but what it does have to do with what is what you can do with the R scripting language that really enhances what is even possible inside of Power BI. All right, so here's, what, here's the example we're gonna show next. Uh, in the next example, and I'll tell you what, I'm gonna close this out. And we'll go ahead and kill this as well. In this next example, we're going to be pulling in a new data set, and, but, but I have a new kind of requirement here that may be something that you need to do, but it's a little bit tougher to, to find ways to, to do this. And so here's my scenario. I need to be able to pull in a data set that is coming in from a zip file. Okay, so I have a, uh, some data in a zip file and I wanna easily be able to bring that in. I don't necessarily wanna even unzip it. I wanna leave it in the zip file location, bring it into Power BI and start to use it as a data set. On top of that, my data set is not only zipped, but it's also on the web. So I wanna go download this data set and unzip it and then bring in the particular table that I want for the example that we're, we're, we're doing here next. And that really is, is one of the things that's possible with R. With R, you can, you can actually take and unzip things very easily. It's really not a ton of code to be able to do this. Let me go ahead and show you what the code looks like for this example. So here's my code I have. It's only, if I were to smush all to get this together, a few, four, five, six lines of code. Uh, oh, sorry, there's a little bit of cleanup task here on the bottom as well but it's really not a ton of code that we're working with here. Basically what we're doing in this example is we're creating kind of this little in-memory temporary table or temporary file. And we're going to download this data set. There's a baseball data set. I have a couple baseball example, examples today, but I have stored on this URL, this zip file location, I have a baseball data set. And so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go download that data or find that location. I'm gonna store it in a temporary location, which is gonna be cleaned up later on. So it's not gonna keep the zip file. It's gonna actually ditch it later. I'm then going to unzip it. This is a little unzip script here, UNZ. There's um, two different unzip scripts that you can use in, in R. But I'm gonna unzip it and I'm gonna find a particular file name called Teams. Now you could pull in multiple file names if you wanted to, but I'm gonna pull in just this one, the CSV file called Teams and bring it into uh, Power BI and start to use it as a data set. Now on the bottom here, it does a little bit of cleanup. So on the bottom here, it's going to do things like uh, really ditch or un un unlink or remove any of the file, temporary file locations that we have. And so it's just a little bit of cleanup at the bottom here. But what I can do with this, if I copy and paste this, let's copy this out and go back over to Power BI. You can see we're kind of a fresh instance of Power BI here. And what I would like to do is, I, again, I wanna use that as a data source. I wanna use this script as a source. Now I showed you very early on that you can use R scripts as a source if you go under the get data section. So if I go to get data, and you can either type R here, R script, or if you don't feel like typing it, you can scroll all the way to the bottom and you'll find it here as well. So I'll select R script and hit open or connect, I mean. And again, very similar to what we saw earlier, it's gonna give you basically this empty editor where you can copy and paste code in, you can do whatever you want with it. Um, this is, again, this script you could also take into RStudio. I usually recommend folks actually go into RStudio first and um, attempt to run scripts there first to validate if they're gonna work before you come to this editor that's not as nice as RStudio. But I can take this and paste this in here. And it's the same code I just had in my notepad document a moment ago. Hit OK, and what it's going to do is it's going to go download that zip file and hold it temporarily and be able to present the CSV file called Teams. Now, one thing I'll point out to you, this is something that actually took me a while to figure out that I was making a mistake on. Some of this stuff is case sensitive. So, for example, Teams, it does have to be a capital T here because the file name inside of that zip file is a capital T. Now, you'll notice here that's coming through as a lowercase t, but that's because of somewhere else later in the, the data set, I reference it as a lowercase t. So I've got this reference pulled in here. I'm gonna go ahead and select the Teams file, and you can see it's bringing this data set in. Again, this is all from a zip file that's stored on the web somewhere on a 
uh, file server somewhere. And I can select Teams, go ahead and bring that in, hit load, and that'll bring this now into the Power BI desktop. It's now bringing it into the data model. Okay, so it's in the data model now, and now it's all in memory. I can use use it and abuse it however I want. Um, this is actually the same data set that we were looking at earlier as far as the different baseball teams that are available. So I can build out a nice report with this if I wanted to um, build another scatter plot. We've already done that, though. Okay. All right. Uh, the next example I want to show you is getting into some of those capabilities that I was talking about with the R script showcase. So let me bring that back up for a moment. So here's the R script showcase. Again, I recommend you taking a look at this if you're really trying to learn what's possible with R. This is a great place to start. There's a lot of different uh, primarily visuals that you can work with. Um, when you go to any of these, for example, the decision tree one or the forecasting one, or let's go to clustering for a moment. If I were to go to clustering, you can, of course, see a screenshot of what it can do, but it'll also give you some instructions on what you need to have downloaded. So you'll need to have the R engine installed. We kind of already talked about that earlier. And then you can actually download the PBIX file. This is the Power BI desktop file right here that you can then use. Uh, and it'll also have the R script, probably should have it embedded into the, um, the, the PBIX file. You can also see there's an R script separated here if you wanted to just take the script by itself. That's also an option. So what we're going to do in our example is I'm going to open up a completed Power BI desktop file so you don't have to watch me pull in the data. Uh, but it's going to be based off that example that had the map in it. So just a reminder of which one we're talking about here. Let me take a step back, and I'm going to show you this guy right here. This is the one mapping with connecting lines. I want to show you in this example how you can do that yourself. And, and actually, in this case, I opened the completed example. Let me open the one that's not already done right here. All right, so once this opens up, I'm going to show you how you can use the R script visuals to be able to enhance what type of visuals you can use. Okay, so this is just a blank design surface with a data set in it. Here's what my data set looks like. This one, you're actually looking at travel data, latitude and longitude data in here to see where uh, flights are coming and going to. So a lot we're having going into Melbourne. Australia. This is all Australia data. You saw the map a moment ago. But I want to be able to take this data, pass it into an R visual, and then be able to use that to visualize um, a, a different type of visual that I don't even have available inside the visualizations gallery. Now, you, of course, do have custom visuals, and you can find R strip visuals inside of the, the custom visual section here as well. I recommend you take a look at those as well. So if you select this um, custom visual store, I'm a big proponent of this, obviously, most of you know, you'll find there are a bunch of R strip sources in here as well. So if I search R script, uh, let's just try R. These are actually one of the a set of visuals that are all powered by R. Um, many of them are. This one doesn't happen to be. But a lot of these top ones here, the clustering one, association rules, correlation plot, these are all powered by R. The nice thing about these is you don't necessarily have to learn R to be able to use them. And what they allow you to do is basically take them in like any other custom visual. And you can just plot data into them. Now, you do have to have the R engine installed, and it might have to install some uh, library scripts for you. Remember, I showed you how you could install that package earlier. It may require you to install some packages, but it oftentimes will do that automatically for you. All right, so the point of what we're doing, though, is not necessarily a custom visual. It's creating this visual from scratch. So you see you have this capability to create R visuals up in the visualizations pane, and I want to take advantage of that. I know that really gives me a lot of open capabilities. Uh, remember I mentioned you can do things like looking at the operating rooms and their utilization. In this case, we're going to be looking at travel data. And so I'm going to go ahead and select the, the R script visual. Tell it that I want to enable it. Yeah, that's fine. Uh, now, I have noticed one thing with these that you might want to take, a, take advantage of is you may actually want to do some things like resizing this a little bit. Um, so maybe you can kind of expand this a bit. You can kind of uh, uh, basically, I'm telling you, I would recommend resizing this or reorienting, reorienting it ahead of time uh, because I've noticed that the R script visual uh, itself can be can be a little finicky once you resize it after you bring in the data. So go ahead and resize it ahead of time. Okay. All right. Um, yeah, Eric, I see your comment. Yeah, I mentioned early on, some of this stuff won't necessarily be predictive analytics, more showing you our capabilities. Then this next one I'm going to show you, assuming we have time, is going to actually be looking at a decision tree, which 
is pretty analytic. So yeah, we'll, we'll get to that. This is more of a basic one first, then we'll get to um, one that's a little bit more focused on pretty analytics. Okay, so uh, in this case, I'm going to bring in the the different fields that I want to make part of this visual. So usually I oftentimes will check every field here because I want them to be available inside of the code set that we have on the bottom. If you don't check off a field, then it's not going to be available to the R script editor on the bottom. So you'll notice in the bottom you have this whole R script editor that's popped up. And the way that you can use this basically is you can basically drop in the code that you're going to use for the visual that you're working on. So in this case, uh, we have a map visual here. And there's a couple libraries that we would install here. Let me point out what's going on here. There's a couple libraries up top. There's a maps library. There's a geosphere library that you would install. You would do these inside the uh, RStudio, for example, to be able to install those packages. And then the rest of it is actually focused on the visual itself. So I can take the, the rest of the, the, the set here. You can see it's making certain references to, to columns that we have. Um, so you'll even see you can do things like modify the colors. You can see kind of these red orange colors are going to appear in the color palette that we're working on. You can certainly take this and modify it quite a bit to do what you want it to do. But in this case, I'm going to pretty much take it as is, paste in that code down here and hit the little run button right here. You'll see there's a little run script button. It's kind of small, but this run script button will allow you to uh, actually execute that script. So if I hit that run script button, You'll see it'll build out that visual, okay? And again, you'll notice as you resize it after the fact, it's a little slower to be able to react. Uh, but you can also do things like have this R visual interact and do cross highlighting with other visuals that you import. So if I were to have something like a basic bar chart in here too, and I brought in something like the, um, the years and uh, a count of all the flights, I can have this R visual. Now you'll notice it's a little bit slower, but you can have this R visual interact and do cross highlighting between the different options or the different uh, charts that you have. Uh, so I select the lowest year here. You see that the, the, the filter brings it down to a much smaller scale of uh, values. So it's a nice little add-in. It shows you what's possible, what you can add into Power BI, even though there's no visual that necessarily does uh, quite like this, the, the mapping capability. Um, but again, you'll notice that there's a little slow reaction between the cross-highlighting of multiple visuals. Now, the last one I'm going to show you is, is definitely a um, uh, one that's focused on predictive analytics. Um, this one is all going to be around a decision tree example. And so what I'm going to open up here, this is a typical, if you've done any kind of machine learning or uh, Azure ML uh, examples, you'll oftentimes see this example. This is actually going to be the Titanic survival rate. And so it's going to look at different characteristics of someone that was on the Titanic. And based on their characteristics, we're going to see whether or not uh, they would have likely survived. Okay, so it's kind of a little morbid example here, but this last example is actually showing the custom visual capabilities that I talked about a few moments ago. So I mentioned you have the capabilities of importing R values uh, through the R script visual. You can also find them through the custom visual gallery up top here. So I already have done that. You can see the decision tree visual right here, but again, if you were doing this for the first time, you would come up to the from store option. And we can search decision tree here if we wanted to. Now, if you're not entirely familiar with what a decision tree algorithm is, basically the, the idea of the decision tree is how did some something or how did the end result uh, come to that decision? So say, for example, you're running a store, okay? You're, you're a retail example. Retail is easy for this. And you're trying to determine why did one customer buy from me while another customer did not buy from me? Well, there's probably a lot of factors. It might be where they live. It might be their age. It might be how many children they have. It might be whether or not they own a home. There's a lot of factors that might go into the reason why somebody would buy from you. And so what a decision tree does is it takes in all of those different attributes that you're trying to determine uh, how they're a factor. And uh, you also pa pass in some kind of a measure. So the measure is like a, a like a yes or no. Did they buy from me or did they survive in this case? Um, did they fill out a survey? Yes or no. So you're trying to get typically a yes or no answer back. Okay, kind of a bit. And then I would hit um, add here to bring this visual in. And then we would be able to pass in our fields into this visual. In this case, it's already it already exists. And it would be able to uh, return back the reason why someone did or did not choose to buy from me, or in this case, why someone did or did not survive the Titanic um, sinking. So 
In this case, we're going to bring in the decision tree visual. I'll go ahead and make this a little larger here again. And we're going to pass in the different attributes that we want to look at. So the, the target variable is generally going to be um, the, the, the the different kinds of things that you want to look at. So things like the did they survive or not, or did they buy from me or not. The target variable is what the decision is that you're trying to evaluate. And so I'm trying to determine whether or not someone would have survived. So I would drag and drop survived into the target va uh, variable. And then for the input variables, you're passing in the different attributes that may have been a factor in that decision. So their age might have been uh, a contributing factor. Their gender might have been a contributing factor. You know, women and children first, right? Uh, their passenger class, so whether or not they were first class, second class, third class, that sort of thing might have been a factor. And you can see as we bring in those fields into the input variables, it actually generates a nice deci decision tree here for me where I can see the reasons why something occurred. So I can make this a little larger so we can look at it a little bit better. And we can see here that it looks like um, that one of the major factors here is gender. So if they were uh, female, so male is going to the left, female is going to the right. So you can see the, the gender equals male, yes, goes to the left. Uh, females are going right then, it has to be. And we can see how that split actually impacted. And so we see first it based off of gender, then we see it based off their age, then we see it based off of, uh, towards the very bottom, their, their class, the, the passenger class that they were. And you can see passenger class here as well. So third class likely did not survive. And you can actually look at the different ranges here on the bottom of which ones were more likely to survive versus others. And of course, like I mentioned in the previous example, all this actually will work with other visuals that you have. So if I have something else in here, maybe I was looking at something like um, uh, a column chart where I was looking at the passenger class and the survival rate based on passenger class. Let me make that actually into a value. There we go. So I can see third class was, um, in this case, there was a lot that survived that were in the third class, but a lot of this might have been more of a factor of um, their, uh, the larger number of people in third class versus the lower number of people in first and second class. But again, the other thing that we can do with this is I can now use this for cross highlighting. I can select certain values. I can select first class and see how that actually impacts the visual. Now we're looking at just first class passengers and whether or not they survived or not. Um, we can look at second class and so on and so forth. So we can use this as a way to be able to filter down our data set and just return back to things that we care about. So uh, we only have about five minutes left, and I do want to save some time for questions. Uh, there, I should mention, one other thing I should mention is I mentioned Azure Machine Learning a couple times. Azure Machine, Machine Learning, if you're working with that already or if you're interested in working with that, that also does have some capabilities to be able to integrate into Power BI. Uh, you can use that as a source, for example, if you've already created this nice algorithm and uh, a test inside of Azure ML. You can then use that inside a Power BI as an R script source to be able to bring those values in and certainly show those here as well. What a lot of people also will do in Azure ML is they'll take the results of an Azure ML um, result set and they'll pump it into like an, uh, an Azure SQL database. And then you can, of course, use an Azure SQL database as a source and set a Power BI as well. That's that's fairly simple to do. Um, so real quickly, I'll, I'll take a look at what kind of questions we have. If you have any, you can kind of, kind of go ahead and queue them up. Um, so is the course you're talking about a free course? So I, I believe I saw that pop up whenever I was talking about the R course. Um, it is a paid course, but we do have where you can do a free trial of it if you want to test it out and see if it's something you like. Um, so that is actually done by Brian Cafferty. He's a really good guy. Uh, and then the other one, I think I already answered Eric's question. But um, any, any other questions? That's insane to be somebody's typing or something. Oh, he changes mind. Okay, so uh, I mean, <laughs> it, like, uh, uh, whatever you did, like, is an amazing presentation. Uh, we really like it, and um, I mean, in the name of the Global Power BI community, I hope like uh, we can have you back, like, doing another presentation another time. But this is was really good stuff that you show over here, and all the capabilities of the R into the Power BI. I saw this like. Uh, uh, some presentations, but nothing like this. And I really like this last presentation that you did. Oh, thank you. Appreciate it. And then, um, Eric, if someone's asking about where they can find the recording, will that be in the uh, Facebook? Yes. Uh, we're gonna put it like on the, our YouTube channel, and also like we can po we're gonna post the link in the Global Power BI Community uh, Facebook uh, account that we have. 
And um, if you have any material that we can share with the with the attendees, like I mean, feel free to send it out to me, and then like I can forward it to the to the attendees. Sounds good. I'd be happy to. Thank you, Devin, and uh, have a good one. Thank you. I think you guys.